you see behind me my workplace that I'm a little bit homesick for um, because that is a screen I downloaded of the entrance to South Carolina's oldest and best military museum. I'm getting some funny lighting here. Give me a second. No offense to colleagues in other places, our state is full of great military museums. Uh, but I'm very partial to the Confederate Relic Room, uh, which actually began as a military museum in 1896. We've had visitors coming in signing the guest book since then, so it's quite a legacy. Uh, and our job is South Carolina military history. So that's what we'll be doing some of today. Please forgive any technical hiccups that happen. Let's see. And as I mentioned, folks, this is a new platform for me. A lot of folks are learning the platform right now, so perhaps you'll be patient with me. Okay, well, here we are, and today's topic um, if I might be permitted the briefest of digressions, I think that we study history to understand people. Uh, that when we lose sight of that, uh, that we lose much of the benefit of um, this finest of disciplines. And to go a little further, if history is social studies, uh, the study of people, and their interactions. Perhaps military history uh, is sort of anti-social studies and um, in a sense is, is the study of people under stress. Uh, and that informs a lot of what I try to pass along uh, in military history and uh, much of my own thinking about it. And so without further ado, let's dig into today's topic uh, and I called this lecture, How to Be a Villain. Uh, that's catchy. It was meant to grab some attention. It perhaps would be more accurately stated as how to be remembered as a villain. Because we're going to take two despised figures in South Carolina military history uh, and talk a little bit about why they are so despised. And if you are so disposed and you too want to go down in history as a villain, it's not enough just to be one. You have to do the public relations right as well. So if anyone's taking notes today on how to be remembered as a villain, I think I've got some pretty good advice. So he's got his notebook, I've got my PowerPoint, we're in great shape. And to kick off our little discussion, uh, I usually ask for responses, but we're on a tight time schedule. So when we think of a hero, it's, it's pretty typical, you know, Hollywood usually casts its most attractive people as heroes, as physically attractive that is. I, I hero in appearance we think of as a, a handsome fellow. Uh, facing danger, of course, uh, a hero is cool and collected and, and self-sacrificing. A hero is the guy that, that jumps out to be the human shield between the innocent and danger. Uh, the hero perhaps laughs in the face of danger. Scarlet Pimpernel style, or maybe he faces it reluctantly, but bravely. As a leader, a hero, he's, we think of him as thinking of his own needs last. He takes care of his people, he inspires them by 
example, and perhaps even eloquence. And of course, we think of a, a hero's personal life as pretty much flawless. When, when we want to make up a hero, I want, if I wanted to create a person to admire, these would all be characteristics. Uh, now, this is the hero of fiction, not of history. But those things do interact with one another. Can we simply reverse that to create our villain? That often happens. Okay, so the villain is ugly. Uh, the, the villain perhaps is uh, diminutive, maybe he's, he's little, maybe he's misshapen, maybe he's giant, but we tend to think of the villain as not the most attractive figure. Facing danger, the stereotype in our heads is that the, the villain leaves those that he's leading in the lurch as he sprints away to safety that he faces danger only reluctantly, uh, that perhaps he has a daring scheme, but it's very careful about his own scheme. Which means if we've decided to follow the villain, you know, minion is a terrible job description uh, because we think of the villain as, as you know, willing to sacrifice everybody else, uh, especially those looking to him for leadership and in his personal life. Well, maybe he spoils his cat, but other than that, our, our made up villain, the kind we get from Hollywood, uh, he tends to be a, a complete train wreck because of how he treats people. Uh, would you all agree I've, I've given pretty good stereotypes here of what we think of as the hero and the villain? Um, so let's look at our fellows that we're talking about today and see how well they line up with our pictures. Now, stop my share here for a second. I'm reasonably sure it'll come back. Both the men I'm going to talk about today happen to be cavalry commanders. Now, I, I know we've got all levels of military uh, orientation out there and historical orientation. Uh, cavalry soldiers are going to be riding in the 1800s and the 1700s that we're talking about today. Uh, they're riding on horseback. And there's a very simple fact about that. Rudyard Kipling expressed it in one of his poems by saying that men have two legs and horses have four and two into four goes twice and nothing over except our lesson and very cheap at the price. The lesson he's talking about in that particular poem is the fact that mobility, moving fast, is a huge military advantage but only if you use it correctly. So of all the commanders in the 18 and 1700s, a cavalry commander above all has to be decisive, has to make decisions fast and use his people in a hurry because if he doesn't act quickly, he gives up the big advantage cavalry have the reason for them to be out there, the reason the knight piece in the chest moves in that sort of irregular fashion, it can hop over obstacles and it attacks from the side, from the flank. The cavalry are supposed to be fast moving and if they don't move fast, they can't do their job. If their commanders don't make decisions quickly, they can't move fast. So that kind of limits who becomes a cavalry commander, and it's gonna affect the personalities of, of uh, both of our guys here today. The first that we're discussing, Bloody Ban, they called him, Benastre Tarleton. Like they made the name up for a villain. You know, not, nobody 
makes up a Hollywood hero and gives him a first name like Benastre. And you see a famous painting here of Tarleton. He was the British cavalry commander in the American Revolution, um, especially here in the Southern Theater. Uh, so he's fighting against the Americans who are, are fighting for our independence in that war. And he's going to be well remembered, partly because maybe the most famous nickname of that war is the Swamp Fox. That's the most famous uh, South Carolina wartime nickname. And legend has it, although even this is argued, uh, that it was Tarleton who said that he could not catch that Swamp Fox and thereby gave the Swamp Fox his famous nickname. Uh, Tarleton's men, you'll notice in the picture there, he is wearing a green jacket. And his men were referred to as the Green Jacket Dragoons. And an interesting thing about him, um, his men in the American Revolution, his men were all Americans. His whole unit of cavalry, uh, of dragoons, which were specialized horsemen, uh, were actually Americans who did not favor the cause of independence and were sticking with the old loyalty fighting for the king. Tarleton himself was an Englishman. So now PowerPoint, move ahead like you're supposed to. Uh, and an Englishman who was well known in college as sort of a jock. Um, he was not accomplished in his studies. He was accomplished in athletics, he inherited a lot of money and wasted it recklessly. Um, had many misadventures and used what was left of his money to purchase a commission to buy an officership in the British Army, which is how it was done mm -hmm. in those days and wound up leading these loyalist cavalry on this side of the ocean. Now, how did he get his nickname Bloody Band? Well, this all happened at the Battle of the Waxhaws in 1780. And ironically enough, it happened partly because Tarleton's men really loved him. He was a guy who um, had a lot of charisma. He had a lot of uh, macho. Um, the ladies loved him and his own soldiers loved him. Here's a description of him written down. We have said that Cornwallis had subordinates who were foot, hand, and staff, and sword to him. Tarleton was his hunting leopard, glossy, beautifully mottled, but swift, fell. When roused by resistance, ferocious. He was the falcon, which, when unhooded, unhooded and cast off, darts with arrowy swiftness on its prey. Few were the commanders opposed to him who he did not at one time or another surprise. Tarleton was a man of imposing and when necessary, dignified manners. His conversation was that of a soldier and well-bred man of the world. There was not an appearance of bloodthirstiness about him and he knew how to be studiously courteous to a foe. We cannot convince him ourselves that he was cruel by nature or took any pleasure in the atrocities committed by his band. Well, what were those atrocities? Um, Benastre Tarleton's assignment is to suppress the rebels in the back country of South Carolina. And he's a study in how not to do that. Benastre Tarleton tended to win every battle he was in. If he was in a pitched battle, uh, he fought very effectively. In between battles, he was trying to suppress the rebellion through terror and intimidation. So Tarleton might defeat a rebel band, but he created more rebels wherever he went. Uh, among his other winning qualities, he was a, he was a religious bigot. Um, if he happened upon, oh, wow. I just got a message from Zoom and they're granted us a little extra time. Why is it? 
Um, maybe they're monitoring me because I'm certainly less than halfway through. Charlton would check your family Bible if your cabin was by itself in the woods. And if that Bible happened to contain or be accompanied by something called the Scottish Psalter, uh, which was the Psalms of David, <laughs> rhyming English verse to be easily sung or memorized. In that case, he would burn down your cabin. Because if you had the Scottish Psalter, you were probably a Presbyterian, and the Presbyterians were all rebels. Well, <laughs> if they weren't, when he arrived, they were all rebels when he left. Uh, in particular, he burned down Presbyterian churches. This is a study in how not to do counterinsurgency warfare. Uh, although he won battles, he continually um, offended and uh, did things to enrage the local population. So, is he a villain? Well, he's certainly the handsome guy. Uh, nothing like our picture of the ugly villain. Rather, this glossy hunting leopard sounds like um, almost the, um, uh, a romantic hero. And in fact, he's got a fan club of ladies to this very day. But how he's carrying out warfare definitely made him enemies. And the worst of it was the battle at the Waxhaws. Now what happened at the Waxhaws was an American force, a Patriot force had surrendered and laid down their weapons and been surrounded by Tarleton's Green Jacket Dragoons. But somebody off in the wood line had not surrendered. Someone fired a shot. The shot struck Tarleton's horse, which fell, and he fell. Believing that the prisoners had not stopped fighting, even though they claimed to have surrendered, that they had continued fighting, but worst of all, that their beloved commander, Tarleton, had been killed, the divisions charged among the prisoners and with sabers um, hacked a bunch of the unarmed and helpless men to death. This resulted in the saying, Tarleton's quarter. It meant to show no mercy. Was Tarleton responsible for that? Well, his men thought he was dead. So clearly he couldn't have ordered it because if he spoke up and when he spoke up uh, and they realized he was alive is, is when the massacre slowed down and stopped. But who is responsible for how the men act? The military answer is the commanding officer. So we have a, a dashing and handsome and in many ways effective leader, but also a man who is remembered for arrogance and atrocities. And he kind of reminded me of another character. You guys uh, recognize the fellow on the left? Yeah. Beauty and the Beast fans out there. Uh, Tarleton was a, a guy who Others gathered around and followed through his magnetic energy, decisive and bold. And well, Disney hasn't given me the rights to this, but we have a, a modification of the song here. Uh, no one strode like Tarleton, no one rode like Tarleton, no one cut prisoners down in the road like Tarleton. There's no not much need to canvas opinions. It doesn't take too much research. You could ask any South Carolinian whose green jacketed troops had just burned down the church. His reputation was so bad that at the final surrender, when Cornwallis is going to take his British troops back over the ocean home, the British officers were invited to come and have a meal with their American counterparts, a, a sort of a um, no hard feelings, the war is over, farewell. But the invitation specified that Pedestre Tarleton was not invited. Well, let's move along to another guy. Uh, 
Um, we'll get to Tarleton's post-war records shortly. Oh, I'm sorry. I really ought to mention, Tarleton serves sort of as the villain in two movies. Now, any movie you see about history, I don't care who made it, please just consider a movie to be an advertisement for history books, okay? Um, by their very format, movies require that characters be combined and details be changed and drama be heightened and the story, most of all, be simplified. So let it grab your attention and pull you in, but don't take it for fact. Uh, in fact, in one movie in which Charlton serves as the bad guy, uh, an R-rated Mel Gibson super violent movie, um, uh, The Patriot, they changed his name because they also changed many things about his character. Most of all, they changed the fact that he died in the movie during the war. Mel Gibson gets to kill him. Um, in real life, he went home to a successful political career. <laughs> and that's why he also appears as the villain in a different movie, a film called Amazing Grace. And that movie, Amazing Grace, is about the story of British abolitionist William Wilberforce, who's trying to fight slavery in the British Parliament. Guess who is his main opponent? That's right, our old buddy, Tarleton. Tarleton had become the member of Parliament from Liverpool, and as such, represented the interests of the shipping trade, especially the slave trade. Tarleton was pretty shameless as a politician. He had lost two fingers off of his hand in the last battle of the war at Cowpens. And you can see at one point in that film, Amazing Grace, he holds up his maimed hand, but they don't explain it. He actually did that in his political campaigns all the time. He said, um, I've given two fingers for king and country. Who here has done more? So he played on his career um, in the military uh, for his politics pretty hard. I'm gonna be so much smoother at this program tomorrow, you all. Thank you for bearing with me today. And this is his monument. It says a lot about him. He's still a hero in his hometown, uh, very much admired as a military figure and not thought of as the villain that we think of him uh, as on this side of the ocean. His monument says he was a hero his youth's idol, glory, he courted on the battlefield and won. That pursuit of glory is something he's going to have in common with the other subject of our discussion today, uh, the dashing Union cavalry officer, Judson Kilpatrick. Now, they had a lot in common, and one of the things they had in common was a lot of burning stuff down in South Carolina. Uh, General Sherman's campaign through South Carolina is famous for the destruction that it caused. Um, all armies in enemy territory would take supplies. They didn't ask. They just grabbed your stuff. However, Sherman's army had additional orders. Take what you need. Destroy everything else. Leave the people uh, with nothing. Destroy their food supply, destroy the animals they use for agriculture. Uh, commonly, the first thing Sherman's men would do on coming to a house, uh, pet dogs are usually very protective and they learn to shoot the pet dog first thing. Well, if you want people to hate you for a couple hundred years, uh, show up and kill the family dog uh, before <laughs> you take all the food and steal the house and, uh, and burn down the house. Um, and it is Kilpatrick's men, because remember, he's a cavalry commander. Kilpatrick's horseback men, who are the ones who move fastest, move furthest out from the column, and do a lot of the burning and looting. And while Sherman himself was often melancholy, to say the least, uh, Judson Kilpatrick, he appeared to be having the time of his life. Um, he was sending snarky messages to headquarters. We'll get to a couple of those. Uh, he, he really was not seeming to regret the kind of war that he was fighting. 
He first came to prominence as part of what was called the Raid on Richmond, sort of a Union special operations adventure, uh, an attempt to capture or kill Jefferson Davis was the raid on Richmond. Um, and it was bold, it failed, but it marked a number of officers as, as having a lot of initiative, as being those people who made quick decisions. And it enabled Kilpatrick's rise in the cavalry. Even then, he had a pretty notorious uh, personal life. Um, Benastre Tarleton uh, was famous for his relationships with various women. Judson Kilpatrick almost had a duel with George Custer over a woman. And both of them were married men at the time, and the lady was not the wife of either one of them. So I don't know how they thought they were going to explain it. Uh, before their commanding officer stopped it. Here we see him after a couple of years of war. A little kill, they called him. He was not tall and imposing like Tarleton. He was a little guy, about five feet. Cavalry soldiers were often small. And little kill, as they called him, eventually his men began to refer to him as kill cavalry. And they were not talking about enemy cavalry. These guys were talking about themselves. Uh, Kilpatrick gained a reputation during the war as somebody who looked out for himself and not necessarily anybody else. His men certainly felt like they were sometimes used as cannon fodder. His commander was not fond of him. Now, it's worth noting that Sherman never liked a cavalry commander. Um, but he wrote about him. And when your commanding officer doesn't just say, but writes down things like this about you, it, it doesn't bode well. I know that man is a blankety blank fool, he said, but that's what I need to command my cavalry on this expedition. As for Kilpatrick himself, we've got a wonderful note hand signed by him in the museum boasting about how much destruction is going to go to happen when he goes through South Carolina and how the state will curse the day she fired on Sumter and curse Kilpatrick and his cavalry. He also sent a note from a nearby town here called Barnwell. He sent a note to Sherman that said, I'm in a town called Barnwell, but they'll call it Burnwell before I'm done. Local people in Barnwell claim that Sherman sent out officers to invite the ladies of the town to a required regimental dance. And by invite, I mean demand their presence. And while they were forced to dance with his officers that his foraging parties burned down the houses. I can't find that this is strictly true. I, I can't find evidence, but everyone who heard it believed it at that time. And why did they all believe it when they heard it? That was Kilpatrick's reputation. Traveling through South Carolina at the end of the war, he had kind of fallen apart. His wife died in 1862, and she was the last restraint, it seemed, on his behavior. By 1865, he's not riding a horse with his soldiers through this state. He's riding in a carriage with his girlfriend and a French chef to prepare their personal meals. Uh, so while um, Sherman is expressing anger and regret about a brutal war policy, Kilpatrick often seems to others to be sort of living it up and enjoying it. He liked to have prisoners walking behind his carriage as if he were a Roman conqueror pulling them along. He has a monument too. Uh, it says simply uh, his name and erected by his comrades and friends. Kilpatrick left a legacy after the war, he would go into politics from New Jersey. He would be appointed the ambassador to Chile uh, in South America, uh, where he got married again. And I'm sorry to say that Judson Kilpatrick is one of the people who gave us Civil War reenacting. Uh, you see, it was a way to publicize his political campaigns, uh, to refight battles as a spectacle, and to ride on on his big white horse and save the day the way he was not known for doing 
during the war itself. In fact, during the war, one of his more <coughs> exploits um, was a battle called Monroe's Crossroads on the grounds of what is today uh, Fort Bragg in North Carolina. And what happened at Monroe's Crossroads, Kilpatrick had gotten a bit floppy. Um, he thought the Confederate cavalry, the, the war was almost over, mm -hmm. and he thought the Confederate cavalry no longer presented a real threat. Well, he wasn't quite right because the Confederate cavalry felt they had a very personal score to settle with Judson Kilpatrick. They weren't attacking for a strategic objective, but much like the raid on Richmond he launched to try to catch Jeff Davis, they wanted to capture Kilpatrick personally. And so Kilpatrick had chosen a campsite where he could stay in a comfortable house with his girlfriend and his security precautions were poor, that they'd gotten a bit sloppy. And the Confederate cavalry surrounded his camp during the night, replaced all of his pickets with their own men. And as the Union bugler raised his bugle the next morning to play Reveille, instead Wade Hampton's bugler played Charge. The Confederate cavalry swept over Kilpatrick's camp, catching the men by surprise, and very importantly to the troopers, catching breakfast in the process of being cooked. But a party of men specifically went to get Kilpatrick. They dashed up to the house and a short little man on the front porch hopped up and down in his nightshirt and said, you almost got him. He just got on his horse. He went that way. And the cavalry soldiers went that way. <laughs> and of course, the man they were talking to was Judson Kilpatrick, uh, who, in a quick thinking way, jumped onto a different horse and dashed off in another direction. But he did so still in his nightshirt. Not only did he leave his mistress behind and his men to a battle that was not going very well for them at that moment, but he literally left behind his uniform. And uh, this became known as, in some circles, the battle of Kilpatrick's trousers. So to compare and contrast our two guys today that both had a reputation of villainy in the state. Um, first of all, both of them were pretty charming. Um, Kilpatrick perhaps in a different way than Charlton was, but in personal conversation, their, their manners were refined. Kilpatrick was, was quite witty on many occasions. He could get himself in trouble and talk himself back out. Uh, but Astrid Tarleton could be very sort of self-promoting, but everyone agreed that he was a very charming man, uh, especially a lady uh, who had actually been sort of the girlfriend of the prince, uh, the prince regent, or not the prince regent, but the, the crown prince in Great Britain, Mary Robinson, and that lady, after breaking up her relationship with the prince, her next boyfriend was Charlton. And this was a big thing in the society celebrity pages of the day. Uh, Mary Robinson was a famous, beautiful actress. Uh, unfortunately for Charlton, she was also an aspiring writer. And a couple of years later, after their relationship with power, she wrote a novel that all of London was talking of because they knew the characters' names had been changed, but it was actually about her and Tarleton. The title of the novel, The False Friend, referring to the dashing but romantically inconsistent bloody Ben Tarleton. So, they're both dashing, handsome young cavalry officers. They were both notorious for looting and burning. Both men were concerned above all things with their reputation. You saw Tarleton's monument uh, and the poem, his youth's idol, Glory, he courted on the battlefield and won. Uh, and Kilpatrick, in his after action reports, he was always a hero in his own words and he was always promoting himself in the press. Uh, both of them were also ladies' men. So where does this take us in our quest today to learn how to be a villain? Oh, 
wonderful um, commonalities here as well. Tarleton commanded American troops fighting against Americans. Among Kilpatrick's soldiers were not just Union soldiers, but Union soldiers from Alabama, nicknamed the Alabama Tories. The exact same thing. Both were accused of mistreating prisoners. Both lost battles that marked their career. Same region. Cowpens and Monroe's Crossroads were very close to each other. Both were self-promoting glory hounds. Both were scornful toward the enemy. And both, unsurprisingly, went into politics. What's different? Well, Tarleton, everyone agreed, was a very physically brave man. Kilpatrick ran away in his pajamas. That does not good, do good for a military man's reputation. Um, tactical smarts. Who was smarter on the battlefield? Well, Sherman characterized Kilpatrick as a fool. No one ever characterized Tarleton as a fool. Their commanding officers had different views of them. And to this day, one has a fan club and does not. But I think our big picture here, if you want to be remembered as a low down nasty villain, this is how to do it. Property damage is critical. You need to leave people with ashes to look at and blame on you. That's that really makes a mark. You, you can't beat that for leaving a nasty reputation. Condescension, just let people know, especially the people you're against, let them know that you're better than them. If you wish to be remembered as a villain, it's important for people to realize that you thought you were simply superior to them. Ironically, if you want to be remembered as a villain, spend a lot of time trying to promote yourself as a hero. The more you do to try to promote yourself as a hero, the more you'll cement that reputation. It certainly was in the, the case of both of these young cavalry officers. I put down winner take all. When you're the villain, you don't cut the guy that comes out on the losing end any slack. You say from the beginning, no quarter. You say, now if I win, I take, I'm taking everything. You live by that code, you'll be remembered as a villain. Finally, to really seal the deal, to be remembered as a villain, break promises to women. That'll do it. That'll do it because they care about that, especially women writers. And Tarleton and Kilpatrick both suffered considerably in their reputation from their personal lives because those stories become part of how they're regarded. So follow those steps. Word of mouth will do the rest so that you too can be remembered as a villain.